Teespring sale happening now. If you want to support the channel while wearing some awesome gear, check out our Teespring store and use the code AAP20 to get 20% off your purchase. The sale has been extended till July 15th, so use the code before it's too late. There, Robin from <laughs> It's finally here! Sailor Moon Eternal, the anticipated movie event for Mooney fans that would retell the story of the Dead Moon Circus in two separate movies. Why two movies and not a new season of Sailor Moon Crystal? And eh, probably because the arc isn't as long as the others, so it'd make more sense to tell the whole story in just two movies. These two films were supposed to be released one at a time, starting in September 2020. But due to COVID restrictions, the movies had to be pushed till early 2021, understandably. The first film released in Japan, and January 2021, with the second film releasing a month later. Shortly after the second film's release, many of us were hoping to see these films in theater, or at least on any streaming site as soon as possible. Because, well, you know how the internet loves to spoil everything. Japan is no exception. I was seeing those screenshots everywhere, guys. Not cool. But it was announced later on that both films would be available on Netflix in English dub starting on June 3rd, 2021. Of course, many fans had an issue with Eternal being on Netflix when you can watch everything else on Hulu. Turns out, however, that that's not really the case now. Apparently for the North American audience, you can watch the original series and movies on Hulu, all of Sailor Moon Crystal on Crunchyroll, and Sailor Moon Eternal on Netflix. Huh, three different streaming sites, what gives? Even though I'm in Australia and can watch both the original series and Crystal on Anime Lab, uh, for now, I too could only watch Sailor Moon Eternal on Netflix. And some people wonder why we hate streaming services. <laughs> Netflix has just announced that they will be streaming episodes of Sailor Moon Crystal on their platform. So yeah, take back everything I just said about Sailor Moon Crystal being on Crunchyroll. Tune in in about five minutes from now, where Disney Plus will announce that they will be releasing all the episodes of Sailor Moon and the movies on Disney Plus for only $3.99 because Disney will buy and consume everything. Back to you, Past Robin. Once it went live, I hosted a streaming party on Discord to watch both films and honestly had an amazing time watching them. Still felt kind of bad for those watching the film with me who had no idea what was going on because yes, it gets ridiculous and over the top, but it still felt magical to me. The question is though, which version told the Dead Moon Circus arc better? Eternal is a more accurate representation of the original Super S manga, but did Super S anime tell it a little bit better even though it was different? Were the characters and villains better or worse? Which one is ultimately better? Well, let's find out with this episode of Old vs. New, Sailor Moon Super S anime vs. Sailor Moon Eternal. <laughs> Sailor Moon Super S aired in Japan on March 4th, 1995 with 39 episodes, but if we're going to review the entire Dead Moon arc, we have to also talk about the first six episodes of Sailor Moon Stars, since one, Nehalania wasn't defeated until Sailor Moon Stars, and two, the Outer Guardians don't even make an appearance in Super S. At all. Well, that was an odd decision. It's also worth mentioning that at this point in the original series, Pluto is considered dead, Saturn is a baby, and living with her still alive father, which leaves Uranus and Neptune doing... Mm. The world is covered in darkness and people are passing out one by one. You'd think they would notice all of this chaos. I don't know, maybe they made this special just to say, yeah, um, they were fighting a random clown puppet while Uranus had the flu. 
That explains everything. Anyone remember this special? Yeah, no, the one where Neptune risked the safety of the hotel inhabitants because she doesn't want to live in a world without Uranus? There seems to be a misunderstanding. The world is only worth protecting if Haruka is living in it. Yeah, even when it's dubbed, that line pisses me off. You claim you want to protect the entire galaxy even if it means harming other people to get the job done, but now only if your girlfriend still exists in this world. Priorities! It's also the special that claims they knew what was going on with the Dead Moon Circus but thought Sailor Moon and the others didn't need any help. It'll be fine. The Messiah can handle it. Along with those girls. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, they totally didn't need any extra help. It's not like Nahelenia got away or anything. Oh, wait. But back to the beginning of Super S, we basically have a brighter version of the third arc, where we take the plot elements similar to the manga while stretching it out into 39 plus episodes and giving our characters a MacGuffin to carry out these episodes. 90s, baby. I'm not really saying stretching the plot is necessarily bad, as long as you're still getting some form of entertainment. But I think Super S was when when this repetitive structure was becoming a little bit stale. Still not as bad as Sailor Moon Stars though. The season starts off with everyone watching the solar eclipse together while not noticing the mysterious flying circus entering their town. Around this time, Chibi Usa starts getting dreams of a winged pegasus named Helios, asking for her help and protection. Turns out, unsurprisingly, the mysterious circus is none other than the Dead Moon Circus, led by our next villain, Queen Nehalenia. Their main objective is to retrieve the Golden Crystal from the captive Helios, who's transformed his spirit into a flying Pegasus. So they need to find the one person with the purest dream to find Pegasus' a spirit and retrieve the crystal in order for Queen Nehalenia to get out of her prison and take over the world. Ah! After 10,000 years, I'm free! It's time to conquer Earth! While this season is considered to be the aesthetic favorite to most Moonies, you can tell if they have a Chibi Usa and Pegasus wallpaper on their phones, yeah, I'm calling you all out. Still love you. But the changes made to stretch out the story only caused more structural issues, especially towards the villains. I will say, though, that I happen to love the villains of Super S because Nehalenia and the Amazon Trio were given sympathetic backstories. Not the quartet, though. They just found Nehalenia and agreed to work for her if it meant they could stay young forever. If you stay a kid, you can spend every day doing whatever you want. You're not responsible for doing anything or being anywhere. And if you're caught being bad, you get out of it by just saying, I'm sorry. Um, they're not wrong, though. <laughs> the trio were never meant to stay in this arc for this long. They were just animals turned human by the quartet, but they're given a bigger role to fill as the first set of enemies for the Sailor Guardians to face. Again, the dream mirrors are the MacGuffins in this season, which is supposed to reveal who is protecting Pegasus. So the trio start to target adults with beautiful dreams, unlike the quartet who target children. But how did the trio choose their targets? They look at the photos of different adults with beautiful dreams and choose whoever they think is their type. Priorities! Tiger's Eye loved beautiful young women, Fish Eye loved handsome men, and Hawk's Eye loved him some milfs. Oh my god, boy, what are you doing with Usagi's mom? That's Usagi's mom, stop it! <laughs> so while their setup and strategy is ridiculously dumb, you honestly can't help but tear up when their story comes to an end. Describing the whole scene would just take a while to explain, but it's a scene that definitely pulls at your heartstrings, and you're just happy to see these three get a happy ending. They're my children, and they deserve happy dreams too. In the manga, Nahalenia was more like Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty, but in this version, she's more like the evil queen from Snow White. Nahalenia ruled an ice kingdom on the new moon and was praised for her beauty ever since she was small. She suddenly gets a vision of her future as an ugly old hag, and it scares her beyond belief. Oh god! What the fuck?! So she decides to absorb all the dream mirrors in her kingdom to keep her immortally young and beautiful as you would, thus turning her kingdom into a literal dead moon, hence the name of their group. Everything else she does from here is to prove what a great and beautiful queen she can be despite being alone and turning her servants into space clowns. Clowns are from space! This approach basically made her more sympathetic, but not as threatening compared to her manga counterpart. So even though I like the changes to some of these villains, they're still not too threatening when they keep doing the same task over and over again. Choose a target, find out the target is a dud, send a random monster after the Sailor Guard 
Guardians. Allow the rinse repeat until Nehalenia is getting tired of your bullshit. As for the Sailor Guardians, um, they get new powers thanks to Pegasus, but they can't unlock their new abilities until they discover something about themselves. I think. Honestly, Ami was the only one to get a real self-discovery moment here while Rei pulled Flame Sniper out of nowhere because she wanted to prove something to her number one fan. And Makoto and Minako were too busy fighting, so Artemis had to literally tell them that they had new powers. Both of you should have latent new powers, hidden abilities, just like Mercury and Mars did. We have new powers? Are you kidding me? I keep forgetting about this episode because Rei and Ami get their own episode, then we get an episode where Usagi and Chibi Usa gets cavities, this is in order, I swear, and then push Makoto and Minako in another squabble between each other, only to put their differences aside when the lives of toddlers are in danger. I swear guys, this is my favorite anime of all time and I love it to bits and pieces, but god damn it. There's nothing much to add since the focus of this arc is on Nehalenia's fight with Chibi Usa, Helios, and Usagi, so the other guardians are just there to help. They each get targeted by the trio with Minako pulling Tiger's Eye and Hawk's Eye along for her play. Pleasure. They're both so different, and they're both so handsome, and the best part is they're both so crazy about me! She doesn't seem to be too concerned. <laughs> Goddess of love indeed, damn girl! They each get their own power-ups, they get new attacks, and that's basically it. Ami likes music though. That was a cute episode. Oh, with the Outer Guardians, as I ranted about earlier, they don't show up until stars. Now Helenia returns to make Usagi suffer, so Setsuna, still alive. She doesn't really address how she survived. Takes Otaru away from her still alive father. Again, no one questions this at all. Otaru gives the Outer Guardians their crystal transformations, which honestly happens in the manga, and they rush to Usagi's side when things with Nehalenia escalates. Everything that happens in these six episodes is absolutely random, since they needed to find a way to end Nehalenia's arc, get the Outer Guardians back into the picture, and give Usagi her eternal transformation. I'm not saying I hate these episodes, though. I mean, Haruka was being a pain to Mercury for no good reason, hence why she's on my bottom tier of my Sailor Moon ranking video, but not Uranus from Crystal, because Uranus from Crystal is the best. But it is an interesting way to connect us to the Sailor Moon Stars arc. <laughs> uh... But of course, the main attraction to this season is without a doubt, the relationship between Chibi Usa and Helios. It may seem like a sweet friendship between a girl and her Pegasus, every little girl's dream, but it turns into a remarkable bond that sparked one of the most memorable relationships in this series. I mean, yeah, we have a little girl wanting to kiss a horse. She didn't even know he was human, so, um... I mean, yeah, it kind of happened in the manga, but it was more of a way for Helios to reach out to his fair maiden, and his human form takes her by surprise. Here, she just straight up wants to kiss him without even knowing that he's human. Still not sure how to process this, but she's a little kid, and it's supposed to be cute, I guess. Even though I prefer how he treats her in the manga with how he fought so hard to find his fair maiden and wants to do everything he can to protect her, this version of their relationship is still pretty cute. Plus, who could forget this memorable moment? Oh, oh, it's just, it's just so magical. And that song, Watashi Tachi ni Narita Kute, Mm. Gets me every time. I love the song to pieces. Everyone loves to sing the pieces. It's just so magical. As for Sailor Moon. Hey, uh, your best friend is strapped to a board. I could die if her dream mirror is destroyed, but I'm happy you're enjoying the show, Usagi. Priorities. I'm mixed on Usagi, but her behavior is not necessarily her fault. She's just another victim of 90s writing. With all these episodes making her fight several monsters over these mirror MacGuffins, this season made her come off as a sympathetic leader, but also an idiot being chased around until someone gives her the cue to do the thing. Do it, Sailor Moon! Super Sailor Moon! Say Moon Gorgeous Meditation quick! Now, Sailor Moon, do it! Now's your chance, you two! Now, Sailor Moon! Chibi Moon! Sailor Now's your chance! Mm. Sailor Moon, now! Do it! Right! Sailor Moon! Chibi Moon! Do your thing! Now's your chance, Sailor Moon! Let's end this, Sailor Moon! I said no! Sailor Moon! Coming! You think she'd know what to do by now, but I'll give them this. 
at least she gets to tell Chibi Usa when to do the thing, because Usagi literally can't use her final attack without Helios being called in to lend his power. Well, that's a bit concerning. Her heart is always in the right place, as we see her trying to give a peaceful solution to her enemies rather than just outright killing them. She shows kindness to Fisheye even though they try to steal Mamoru away, was genuinely happy to see the Amazon trio get a happy ending, tries to help the Amazon quartet when Zirconia tries to drain their energy, and even gives Nehalenia a brand new start in life in her somehow newly refurbished kingdom brought to you by the power of love and friendship. I will say though, this approach made things a little bit questionable. If you want revenge, then go ahead and take it all out on me. Just please leave everyone else out of it. I beg you. They all know now the pain you went through. They will accept you. All of them would be your friend. Really? Are you sure they will? They're literally sailor guardians to protect the galaxy and you. I see what you're trying to do with this and I get the message. It's a really touching scene, but I can literally hear Uranus screaming from her mirror. All of them would be your friend. Uh, hell no. Mm -mm, no, you're my princess. She's not my princess. What makes you think I'm going to be her fucking friend? Let me out. Let me out. I'm going to choke a bitch. Seriously? Overall, I still love this arc. Super S with a hint of stars was a magical experience full of charm and heart. Yes, the 90s pace scene only made our heroes and villains dumber, but each episode was still entertaining in their own right. Am I missing something? Feels like there's something major I'm forgetting to mention, but uh... No, oh, let's just move on for now. Okay, Sailor Moon Eternal. Where do we begin? The movies start off almost the same as Super S, but our villains get the ball running immediately. <laughs> they create a seal around the city in order to blanket the town in darkness, thus keeping all the Guardians unable to transform and making Mamoru incredibly sick. Helios introduces himself to Usagi and Chibi Usa, asking for the help of a fair maiden as Nehalenia has seized control over the Earth's hidden kingdom of Elysian. The Amazonist Quartet sends the Guardians out immediately after they try to transform and fail, so they try to destroy them with their minions, Tiger's Eye, Fish Eye, Hawk's Eye, and... these two creepsters. Please don't look at me like that. that, that's creepy. From here on out, it's a race between our heroes and Nehalenia towards the fate of Elysian and ultimately, the Earth. Not gonna lie, there is a lot happening in this version. Like they cram in so many tiny little details that it's gonna be hard to briefly talk about this, but uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> Oh boy. Our villains this time are much smarter compared to Super S. They know what to do, get it done as quickly as possible, figure out who the Sailor Guardians are instantly, and nearly destroy the world in a far more devastating way. Interestingly enough though, everything I said about sympathetic backstories for the trio and Nehalenia, but not the quartet, is actually reversed in this version. As in, Nehalenia is straight up evil with no remorse and the Amazon trio are kind of plain minions, but the quartet get an interesting backstory, but I'll address that in a minute. Also, does everyone remember Fisheye being the feminine one in the group from Super S? I actually had to go back and read the manga again because I did not remember Hawkseye being the feminine member of the group. It's surprising to see Fisheye and Tiger's Eye carry out their missions so plainly and quickly in order to manipulate Ami and Rei, but Hawkseye honestly stole the first part of the movie because I love them so much. Top 10 anime moms, Hawkeye's in there somewhere, cause look at them. I have the same dream. One day I'd like a shop of my own. Like a little flower shop or cake shop. Wonderful. Now work hard and make it happen. <sighs> Just set a goal for yourself and keep going till you reach it. Oh my god, can you be my hawk mommy? I want you to be my hawk mommy. You're my hawk mom. And I think the writers knew they made a damn good character because Hawkseye straight up gets zapped out of existence in the manga, but in the movie... Though I didn't get to do it long, I got to run my own shop. I was so happy. <laughs> you go realize your dreams. Make them come true, no matter what. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. 
I would say Nehalenia becomes another boring villain, like the Black Moon family and Dr. Tomoe, but honestly, she has a more interesting setup than a queen who was afraid of growing old and ugly. No offense, Super S. I brought up the fairy tale comparison before because that's literally Nehalenia in this version. Like Maleficent, she is kind of the mistress of all evil, or in this case, darkness. As Queen Serenity reigns on the light side of the moon with the Silver Millennium, Nahalenia reigns within the moon's darkness. Once Princess Serenity is born, Nahalenia presents herself as an uninvited guest, and it is literally the Maleficent scene from Sleeping Beauty complete with the curse and everything. Oh my, I came all this way from the moon's depths, and this is the greeting I received from my fellow moon folk. I know who this is, she's evil! Stay away from her! She's a mean witch devil who lives to spread her darkness! Say it louder, Mars! Not sure if she can hear you within child killing range! Two kids gone die tonight! Anyways, Nehalenia basically describes them as yin and yang, light and darkness. Two forces that need to be in perfect balance and exist together. Darkness isn't evil, it's the inverse of light. Accept that and there will be balance. I swear I've heard the speech in Kingdom Hearts. But Serenity senses her true intentions to control over everything and thus seals her away for good. Nehalenia curses the kingdom to fall and it eventually does with her ironically being the only survivor. Whoops. She breaks free from her prison, finds the Amazon Quartet while keeping them under her control, and makes her way to Earth in order to plunge it into complete darkness. Seriously, Zehanor wants your number, girlfriend! In short, Nehalenia is the embodiment of darkness and wants to have complete control over everything while snuffing out any traces of light. Still mixed on which of these two is better, as one has a more sympathetic backstory and the other is just straight up evil, but in an interesting way. I don't know. Honestly, I like both versions of Nehalenia. Okay, as for the Amazonist Quartet, <sighs> oh boy. Nehalenia basically discovers them because they were sleeping guardians of the four asteroids within the solar system. I'm not kidding, they're sailor guardians. Excuse me, what? But we'll address more of this later when we talk about Chibi Usa. As dreams are a major theme in this arc, each Sailor Guardian must discover their ultimate dream in order to unlock their hidden power. Long story short, they all have the same dream, which is to be strong enough to protect their home and their princess. While it may seem a bit lazy to give them all the exact same dream, they honestly wouldn't be able to enact in any other dream since they're chosen guardians. If they're not strong enough to protect their princess and their world, then they won't be able to indulge in their separate dreams. And it's these separate dreams that become the main target for our enemies to take advantage of. The four inner guardians are trapped within their own insecurities that nearly drag them into darkness, but they get their own interventions that push them to break through the barrier and transform into their crystal forms. The outer guardians have their own struggles in regards to their priorities. The barrier is preventing them from transforming, so even if they want to go help, let me repeat that, want to go help, <coughs> they ultimately can't. They also seem to be enjoying having a simple life as a family since they were mostly bound to their stations in the outer regions of space before facing the Deathbusters. Should they just sit back and enjoy the peace that they have or see what they can do in order to protect their planet and their princess? Saturn ultimately reminds them what their dreams are and provides them with their new crystal so they can transform too. Each of the Guardians get their own moment to push through the boundaries in order to become stronger which only shows how incredibly dedicated they are to their princess and their home. And now here's where things get complicated. With the Inner Guardians getting their interventions, they're approached by someone to help them remember what their true dream is. Mars gets approached by her own Guardians, Phobos and Deimos. Their wife is now. And Venus is helped by... Artemis! Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! It's Artemis, 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 Artemis! He gets his human form, he gets his human form! Oh my god, look at him! Look at him! He's so cool! Oh my god, I can't believe it's finally here! Okay, I'm done squeeing now. But Mercury and Jupiter are approached by little versions of themselves. I am a part of you. Really? I'm just another version of you. Huh? I honestly.
honestly didn't get this at first, but let's try to address this quickly. Sailor Moon stars had all 10 Guardians combine their powers in order to make Eternal Sailor Moon. In Sailor Moon Eternal, though, they needed the 10 Guardians and the Golden Crystal in order to awaken Eternal Sailor Moon and Neo Queen Serenity with King and Damien. I am mentioning all of this because all of the Sailor Guardians unlock their Eternal forms too, as well as their princess dresses, and I am trying so hard not to fangirl out here because I love their dresses. Look at them, they're so pretty. But apparently these little versions of the Guardians are tiny guardians of their own palaces. Each Sailor Guardian is a princess of their own planet and had to tap into the power held within their own castles. So these little versions of the Sailor Guardians are called Sailor Power Guardians, and they are only here to give the girls their eternal forms while congratulating them on a good job. Y'all remember your princesses! You did it! I know this arc has a lot of things that are supposed to contribute to the story, but I think these Power Guardians add a little bit too much detail. I can take the Amazonas Quartet actually being Sailor Guardians. I can take Artemis and Diana actually getting human forms just like Luna. But I think Power Guardians are just too much. I liked seeing Artemis, Phobos, and Deimos contribute their support, so why couldn't Mercury and Jupiter get their own sidekicks or something? I mean, Phobos and Deimos are based off of the moons of Mars. Jupiter has the most amount of moons. Just saying. That or, I don't know, just keep things simple by saying the Golden Crystal unlocked their eternal forms. That's it. That is literally all you had to do. Power Guardians are a bit pointless to me, but I digress. Sailor Moon! She stays the same awesome person that she is and that's perfectly fine. She's silly when she wants to be, but gets serious when she knows there's a threat. She even ran to Mamoru's side when he got sick, despite him trying to push her away. She ultimately gets sick like him, but she just really didn't want to leave his side. Also, the dream she has before waking up in Elysian... When I grow up, I just want to marry you. Huh? Oh my god, they're so cute and I love them. <laughs> it's baby Mamoru and Usagi. I am squeezing my cheeks together if you can't tell. As brief as her character arc may seem, she honestly didn't really need to change considering the other two characters we had to focus on. Honestly, this arc was Chibi Moon's existential crisis, the movie. Chibi Moon seems to show how impressed she is with Sailor Moon, but also shows how jealous she is. In her eyes, Sailor Moon is an amazing leader surrounded by awesome friends and has an amazing boyfriend. When Helios approaches both of them, Chibi Moon honestly feels like this could be a moment for her to shine and feels extremely happy knowing someone is depending on her. Remember in Super S how Pala Pala made them switch ages just for the lulls? The same thing happens here, but it only contributes to Chibi Moon's anxiety. Helios acknowledges her as the maiden he's been looking for, which makes Chibi Moon feel like he's depending on Sailor Moon and not her. With Helios showing his devotion to her and with the reveal of the Sailor Amazonas Quartet, the dream arc is not only a story unlocking everyone's true powers, it's also a preview of Sailor Chibi Moon's future when it's her turn to lead her own team. The Amazonas Quartet will be her guardians, Diana will be her version of Luna, and Helios can find a way to be her tuxedo mask. As much as I love the whimsical moments between Helios and Chibiusa and Super S, I honestly see this path for Chibiusa and her new team extremely epic. And again, knowing Helios received a vision of Chibiusa from the future, which prompts him to find her at all costs. I'm sorry, I'm just a sucker for these types of setups. Chibiusa and Helios and Super S find each other because she has the purest dream, but they form a relationship during the time they spend together. Even though they don't spend as much time together in these two movies, you can tell how much Helios and Chibiusa care for each other. Even during his supposed dying moment, Helios gives up whatever strength he has left to protect the Earth, while also giving a touching message message for his princess. And I'm also glad I got to meet the little maiden. <laughs> he loves you. It's only more heartbreaking when Chibiusa finds him and is trying her best to wake him up. Oh, come on, Helios, wake up. But once the seal in his body is broken and she gives him a kiss to wake him up. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is so precious and I love these two. The maiden I saw in my vision. Come on, Slowpoke. It was you all along. And there we have it. 
two completely different takes on the Dead Moon arc. It's fascinating hearing Moonies trying to decide what's better as the Eternal is just copying everything from the original story based in the arc, while Super S is just its own take on the story. Super S may be long and made some of the characters weaker, but it's still packed to the brim with emotional and magical moments that you don't see in the manga. Eternal may stick to the original story, but it packs on a lot of details with a few things I just wish they changed, like the Power Guardians and the child version of Rey in a wedding dress like she's about to marry Tiger's Eye. That's just disturbing. I love both versions of this arc, and I'm sure you can see why this season tends to be a lot of Mooney's favorites. It was honestly hard for me to choose which version was better, but there is one element that ultimately made the decision for me. With all this said, which one is better, in my opinion? Super S or Eternal? Okay, so that big thing I wasn't talking about earlier and the one element I was just mentioning, let's talk about it now. Eternal brought justice to my boy Tuxedo Mask. Like, holy cow, I can't tell you how happy I was to see this version of Mamoru over the original anime's version. Super S's version... I just don't think he had that big of an impact on the story. The main things I remember him doing was throwing his roses on Q, being a target for Fisheye while giving out some ruthless facts. What kind of dream is that to have? Okay, wow, Maru, your words could have killed them, damn! Getting sick when the Earth plunges into darkness, gives an encouraging speech to Helios about dreams, I guess, and he's the main target for Nehalenia's revenge plot in Stars. Oh my god, look at him. Oh, that's just pathetic. He seriously deserved better than this. Oh yeah, I forgot about the time Mamoru shanked a monster to save Sailor Moon from joking. <laughs> Okay, seriously, that was just badass. The main goal of Super S is to find Helios, who's guarding the Golden Crystal. But does it belong to Mamoru? It's honestly not clear, but it appears to harness the power of dreams. That's all we really know. In Salem of Stars, his star seed is golden, like in the manga, but it's still not clear enough to tell if he has his own crystal or not. At the very least, he doesn't really contribute to the final fight. As for Eternal, this season was a time for Mamoru and Chibi Usa to shine. With Elysian under Nehalenia's influence, he gets extremely sick, like holy hell, you thought he had some lung cancer or something, and he has to lie in bed doing his best to recover. While Sailor Moon is out and about trying to protect everyone, Mamoru is left to wonder if he's truly useless when he compares himself to everyone. Usagi is powerful, but what can he do to protect her if she's in danger? He is the prince of Earth, so he should be strong and capable to protect his home and the one he loves. And Helios and Usagi are there to help him out by revealing that he has his own crystal. The Golden Crystal acts similarly to the Silver Crystal and allows Endemia to protect his kingdom. All the time Sailor Moon feels stronger or gets a new power with Mamoru by her side, it's all because of his hidden power. He can finally awaken as a true guardian, revive the lost kingdom of Elysian and awaken his future along with Usagi as Neo Queen Serenity and King Endemion. My god, it's finally happened. I know Eternal has a lot. Like, there's a lot of little details that you have to watch in these two movies. But I am just so happy to see this. Like, I get it. Some of you will say Super S is better because it's a lot more simple and easier to take in compared to everything we get in Eternal. I understand that completely, but I am still choosing Eternal as the best version of this arc. The Sailor Guardians unlock their Eternal forms along with their princess dresses. The fight with Nehalenia was epic to witness. Sailor Chibi Moon gets a glimpse into her own future with Helios and the Amazonas Quartet. And my boy, Mamoru, proves himself to be a contributing guardian to the team. He too is a Sailor Guardian and we finally get to see it. Oh yeah, they gave Sailor Saturn her own transformation in Sailor Moon Eternal. It wins by default. Sailor Moon Eternal was an epic experience that I will watch over and over again. It was close. Believe me, it was super close. And I will always cherish Super S in my heart. So honestly, 
I cannot recommend both versions enough. Unlike a certain other arc that should be next on the line. <laughs> oh, just you wait. Okay, this took way too long to type up, and it gave me a massive writer's block, but can you blame me? Do you see how different these two stories are? This was why I needed a break. But I did it. It's here. And it's done. I'm just gonna go lie down now. This video was exhausting, but before I go, let's see what you have to say. To any fans of this series that have seen both versions of this arc, you tell me which version is better in your opinion. Super S or Eternal? Leave your answers in the comments down below and try to be respectful towards other people's comments. If you are wondering why this video took a while, I usually tell you guys what's going on on Twitter, so be sure to follow me at Anime America to keep up to date with upcoming videos and such. Be sure to leave a like on this video if you, you know, liked it. And I'm just gonna take this moment to thank my Patreon supporters. With YouTube being the way it is, I can keep making awesome videos for you all to enjoy and definitely appreciate your support. I'd also like to give a huge shout out to Laura Pavlovic. I was going through some tough times with personal matters and she was there to offer her help and support while I was trying to make this video happen. Thank you, Laura. Thank you to everyone supporting me through Patreon and thank you all so much for watching this video. More awesome videos will be on the way, so stay tuned to Anime America.